Benjamin Marsequay. I'm a postdoc at the University of Vermont. Uh, today I'll be talking about recovery of late trial in Champlain. Uh, and there have been, I think, a few talks, a smattering of talks on Champlain in here this afternoon. Uh, so forgive me if some of this background is a little bit repetitive. Basic overview, Champlain is a large lake uh, on the border of Quebec, U.S., New York, and Vermont. Uh, if my directions are right, it's about 200 miles that way. Uh, it's about 200 kilometers long, fairly deep, not great lakes deep, but certainly not a small inland lake. Uh, and it's got a complex multi-state, multi-country map. Uh, this is New York DEC, Vermont Fish and Wildlife, uh, Government of Quebec, and then U.S. Fish and Wildlife is also involved as a lot of the Atlantic salmon work uh, and the program of sea land control is an ongoing. Uh, and it has a diverse set of fisheries similar to those in the Great Lakes, uh, minus the Pacific salmon, which my own bias says is a good thing. And in Champlain, lake trout have had kind of a long and checkered history. Uh, they're the dominant native predator species in the lake. They support a really popular recreational fishery. Uh, but they were extirpated in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, probably due to overfishing, uh, and maybe overfishing specifically targeting spawning grounds. Uh, sustained stocking to reintroduce them began in the early 1970s. Uh, and the goal was to restore a wild population. They were native, they were in there reproducing happily before, put them back in, it'll happen again. You can tell where this story is going because it's kind of a classic one. What actually happened, and Ellen Marston back there could say a lot more about it, was we got reproduction, but not recruitment. There were eggs being deposited, there were fry coming off the reefs, there were not juvenile wild lake trout appearing in the population in trawls later in their life stages. So something wasn't quite working. And to complicate all of this for lake trout, you've got the existing threat of sea lamprey. Um, it's arguable whether or not sea lamprey are native to Lake Champlain, but they've certainly been around for quite a while. And then zebra mussels came in in the 90s, potential impacts to the lower food web, to fouling up spawning reefs, a lot of bad things that might be doing to lake trout. And then on top of that, alewife come in. Alewife are potentially a really nice forage base, but they've been implicated in having high levels of thymidase, thymine deficiency, which leads to reproductive failure, recruitment failure. Uh, so there's, the deck was kind of stacked against lake trout, even after the fact that in the 70s they didn't take off. And in, in the face of all of this, in 2015, we started seeing wild lake trout in the lake. And those wild cohorts were sustained from that point forward, and we're still seeing them today. And at the same time, five of the seven trophy lake trout for Vermont's records for Lake Champlain have happened in the last 15 years. So, oh, and, and, survival rates, which is a recent paper we did using maxillary aging, uh, and synthetic cohort analysis, suggests that adult lake trout are surviving very well and far higher than uh, previous historical estimates. So we have this complicated scenario where lake trout, we have signs that lake trout aren't doing well or weren't doing well, uh, and reasons to think they might actually start doing more poorly, and yet, it seems that this is a great time for lake trout in Champlain. Uh, and this led to a decision by the management cooperative to adjust the stocking levels. Uh, there's some wild recruitment going on, unsure how much, uh, but all of a sudden, it's not just stocking, it's not just perfectly controllable. Uh, historically, stocking was about 82,000 fish per year, and that was one-third New York fish, two-thirds Vermont fish. So the decision that was made was to reduce that by 33%, eliminate the New York State component, uh, which is really nice from a logistics standpoint, uh, and sort of see where that got us. However, this did raise some questions. So you'll note here that the New York fish are age one Seneca strain fish, whereas the Vermont fish are a different strain, Champlain strain, which is a 
captive hatchery brood stock, uh, age zero fish, and they're stocked at different times of year. So the first question is, are New York and Vermont fish actually equivalent? Are they one to one? Is this functionally a 33% reduction, or is it a 15% reduction, or a 50% reduction? Uh, can we just interchange New York and Vermont? As I said, there's a lot of reasons to think that they might be different. And then secondly, where are all the wild recruits coming from? Is this one spot in the lake that all of a sudden lake trout are found or it's become better and actually able to sustain recruitment? Is it a diffuse thing throughout the lake? Can we get some sort of sign of whether or not this is going to be sustained or whether this is a brief or blip? And so to do that, and kind of the larger overview I'm going to talk about today, we're combining a really large set of samples. These are going from bottom trawling, which is great for catching age zero, age one, age two, age three fish, uh, gill netting. A lot of that is Vermont Fish and Wildlife, which has actually restarted a summer gill netting program using set sites, set gear, uh, and matching a survey they were doing in the 1980s. Uh, and then some spawning surveys conducted by Vermont Fish and Wildlife and US Fish and Wildlife. Uh, using trap nets and electrofishing as known spawning sites. Uh, taking all of this, and a picture of Vermont crew out of their tail netting last summer, uh, and from this, for every fish getting origin, which is helpfully provided by the fact that all the hatchery fish have a fin clip, combining that with age, so that fin clip actually happens on a five year rotation. So for hatchery fish, if they're not really big, we have a pretty good idea of what year they were stocked. For wild fish, we can use an age length key. So age zero fish, age one fish, age two fish, very different lengths, very easy to tell apart. And then the third piece that I mentioned a little bit earlier is maxillary aging. And so this is just a picture of a maxillary cross section. Uh, this is a stand in for otoliths. So if you've ever read a lake trout otolith, especially an old lake trout otolith, you'll know that they're tiny and they're full of many rings, and it's a real pain. Uh, and this is coming from work at Lake Huron, finding that maxillaries similarly have very readable rings, in fact, more readable. They're a lot easier to work with. And theoretically, if you'd like to, they can be non lethal. So it's not great to be missing a chunk of your jaw, uh, but some studies in hatcheries have suggested that fish don't just die from it. So that's another benefit. Taking all of this, plus tissue samples, ideally fin clips, but also scales or even otoliths that haven't been really washed off. And for stocked fish, taking that to strain. So I put together a uh, microsatellite based sequencing marker panel uh, that allows us to discern Seneca and Champlain fish, which is actually historically quite a tricky thing to do because Champlain fish are largely descended from Seneca fish. Uh, but it does that well, and I'll show you how well in a second. To say for a stocked fish, okay, was this stocked by New York? Was it stocked by Vermont? That's just my standard structure plot for separating that out. And then using that to take that survival analysis that I mentioned earlier and do the same thing, but partition it by stocking source. So are New York fish surviving better? Are Vermont fish surviving better? Um, and at the same time, for wild fish, we can say, okay, does it look like your parents are New York fish? Do you look like a New York fish even though we know you're wild? Uh, or vice versa, do you look like your Vermont parents? Or maybe you're the product of a mix. For wild fish, we're taking this a step further. So that panel I mentioned divides by population, but it's also capable of identifying kin pairs, specifically parent offspring pairs or half sibling pairs, those that share one parent. Uh, and this, plus age, and plus a known kin set. So this was a some hatchery process we did where we knew what the parents were, and we could test and say, we know where you're unrelated, do you look unrelated, we know your parent offspring, do you look like your parent offspring? And combine that with something called close kin market capture. And I've talked probably too much about close kin market capture in the past day of that speaking, so I won't go deeply into that. Uh, but the very short gist is, it's a lot like market capture or estimation of absolute abundance and absolute survival. Uh, but instead of using recaptures of tagged fish, it's using the number of close relations in a sample. 
So if you've got a, a large sample and you see very few close relations, then there must be a heck of a lot of parents out there and you have a large population. Similarly, if you've got a large sample and they are all half siblings, there probably aren't very many adults out there. We can use that to get the size of the overall stock, adult survival, and maybe a sense of spatial heterogeneity and are we seeing kin pairs widely spread across the lake or are they very close in? So, like I said, I'd be showing you a little bit of the separation of Vermont and New York fish. And this is that first plot. Every bar here, this is very much like a structure plot. Every bar here is the probability of belonging to one of two clusters. This is coming out of the naive cluster analysis. So this is a fish. It could be part of the blue or the green. And here, we're saying it's probably about a 97% probability that it's belonging to the blue cluster. I've given names to these clusters, not based on what I told the structuring algorithm, but merely what came out of it and was pretty much evident. These are all fish that came from Rogue Hatchery in 2020. They're all New York lake trout. They assigned to one cluster. Over on the right are all ones that came from Ed Wheat Hatchery in Vermont in 2020. They went into another. And then also in the 2020 stocking cohort, uh, we actually did a double clip on New York fish. So we do see some fish that we've been continuing to capture in the wild that we know are really Vermont or New York fish based on that clipping. And so that's what these two drops in this one single line from New York fish are. And this is about it's, yeah, 65 fish, maybe a little bit less. Uh, perfect assignment. They separate out exactly the way we expect. So, I feel like I can trust this pretty well when I actually go to look at wild fish. When I do so, I'm going to start with adult fish that were taking off of spawning grounds in Lake Champlain. Uh, this is Gordon Landing, which is actually, uh, you were in Matt Fuchsia's talk earlier, it's an artificial gate of break wall constructed just outside of the Vermont fish hatchery. Uh, and then Wayland and Willsboro Bays, down on the New York side of the lake, a fair bit south, around Essex, New York. Uh, and what you're seeing is that, by and large, all the adult fish we're seeing on the spawning reefs, especially down in the southern part of the lake, look like New York fish. There's, uh, what is that, 25% maybe of the Gordon Landing fish that look like they might be Vermont fish. Uh, but the vast majority are New York fish. And as you'll remember, I said that historically New York fish have been stocked as about 33% of the fish going in the lake. Uh, so this, this is kind of raising some eyebrows. The wild fish we see there, Wayland Wild and Willsboro Wild, are unclipped fish that we're finding spawning. They're adults. They also look like New York fish, which means they probably came from two New York parents. And then they're continuing to make wild progeny, maybe, that look like they had New York parents. If you look at wild fish overall, so this is not just adults, this is not just in the spawning season, we see that strong influence of New York parents on all the fish we're finding in the lake. And then if you take this and bring in ages, so younger fish age one through age six, and the years we've caught them, this is pretty noisy and I'm still working with this, uh, but you see the oversized influence of New York in there. So a dashed line there is 66%. If New York and Vermont behaved exactly the same, we would expect the green to be up at 66%. We're not, and we're pretty consistently seeing that. Although it is interesting, down here in recent years in young fish, they're looking much more Vermont. And while New York has stopped stocking, these are the cohorts that will be showing that. Uh, so maybe things are changing a little bit. And if you repeat this for wild fish, it's even more the case. Uh, I don't seem to actually have a working laser on here. Uh, there's maybe some cohorts there, the two-year-olds, up in uh, 2019 down to the three-year-olds in 2020. There's maybe some cohorts moving through for Vermont was a little bit stronger, but nothing I trust. And then finally, the close kin stuff is still in process, but we have identified a number of kin pairs, pair and offspring on the left, half siblings on the right. We can look a little bit about the capture locations of those. Uh, so on the left there, all the blue lines are the line between the location where a parent was captured and where its identified offspring was captured, with the arrow pointing towards the offspring. And those parent 
Pirates were mostly captured in the southern spawning shoals of Whalen and Wellsboro Bay, with offspring captured up in Burlington Bay. Uh, and this tracks with the fact that for wild fish, wild age zero fish especially, we mostly catch them in trawls in Burlington Bay. Don't know what it is about that spot, uh, but some of the parrot fish, whether they spawned in Burlington Bay, whether they spawned in Wellsboro and their offspring made it to Burlington Bay, there's some connection there. Whereas for half sibling connections, no error because it could go either way, there's really a spread throughout the lake, and you can count a few up there uh, in North Atlantic. So, next steps, this is ongoing work. Uh, Gina's going to get a bunch more fish. Uh, and this is actually something that I shipped off for sequencing on Monday. So, hopefully, that's getting done. Uh, a lot of 2022 samples in there and some historical scale samples from the 70s and 80s um, that Vermont Fish and Wildlife found. So I'm excited to see what comes from that, especially when looking at the two strains back then, and even what the strains look like then. Age additional fish, so the CKMR stuff will become a lot more powerful when we bring in ages for the 2022 fish. And then calculating the survival rates, building those key market capture models, and getting those estimates out of there. So hopefully next year I'll have some interesting stuff to put out of and finally, tons of samples, tons of folks involved, really collaborative management team, and a lot of folks to thank. Um, quite, a, quite a number of them are in this room. Uh, as well as 